Testing. Testing. Sound back on? Technical difficulties, my friend. Perfect. Looks like we're back on. I, okay, awesome. Uh, good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, welcome to today's market update. We're going to go through a lot, um, but I there's going to be some just because there's so much information uh, from today, some that I am going to go a little bit more in depth during our all partners meeting uh, tomorrow. So I just want to note that we're going to we're going to jump right into the market update. Uh, and then there are some announcements. Obviously, we've been talking about Zillow and a lot of things that are going on, um, especially in in the kind of aftermath of uh, their recent announcements. Some other thing that's going on at NAR level um, with some new legislation that has come down the pipeline as well that we're going to touch on. So just a lot of information, um, but I'll know I'm going to I'm going to move quickly today because we do have our partners meeting tomorrow and there's going to be a lot of information for us to get through, uh, my friends. So let me go ahead and jump into screen share right away. Beautiful, beautiful. All right. Can I get a thumbs up? That we are beautiful. Perfect. Awesome. OK, so let's go ahead and keep it moving. Of course, we know I always start with the TCPA. Uh, we just want to make sure, again, this is kind of that mandatory disclosure. Um, please make sure that before we begin, uh, obviously, I talk about different scripts, calls that you can use. Uh, and a lot of the language that we're talking about, the language of real estate, is geared to share with your clients. Uh, just ensure that you are scrubbing your list, my friends, and not calling any number on the do not call registry. Okay, looking over at impact of COVID-19 showing, there is not much of an update here, right? This, uh, we'll, we'll monitor this throughout the end of the year and then we may continue to look at it a little bit, uh, but there has not been like fluctuation when it comes to uh, the showing time data. A lot of this is, is that, you know, we're not utilizing showing time data as much as frequently as it was in use uh, prior during the pandemic when we weren't able to do things like open houses. Um, but we just have seen this stay pretty, pretty down, pretty plateaued. We're about down at 12.4% in 2021 in comparison to where we started the year. And yet this is definitely a skewed number as it relates to showings in general. Uh, because again, right, we're, we're looking at a baseline that was created uh, in 2019, the anomaly of 2020. And then in uh, 2021, we've had a lot of changes from showings kind of being on that uptick to then open houses uh, coming back. So we've seen this kind of dip and then remain fairly stagnant across the board. So not the best kind of indicator of information on showings, and yet it's the only true tracking um, of showing time data that exists right now. So we look at it, we review, but we always want to inspect what we're expecting. Moving on over at Los Angeles County sales trends. So we are looking at month to date. Month to date right now is going to go from the 1st through the 13th. So we're looking at October 1st through the 13th to November at 1st through the 13th. Right now that we're in that month of November. In terms of the number of properties for sale, we are seeing a decrease of 8.5% of number of properties for sale. However, when we start looking at our sold properties, there is an uptick of 4.7% in comparison to this, uh, this same period of time last month. Now, a couple things to note here. Number of properties for sale, that's the inventory that is sitting on the market, right? So this is, this is uh, directly correlated with the inventory. As the number of properties sold continues to go up, this will affect the number of properties for sale um, as well as listings that are coming on. So new listings coming on as well as at the sales rate does affect this particular number. What we know is when we're looking at a decrease of 8.5%, that is number of properties for sale from last month, the first through the 13th, how many were coming on the market versus how many there are now from the first through the 13th of the month. Um, this is a number that we anticipate a month over month decline in because of seasonality going from October to November to December. Um, we should continue to kind of see that decline that is, is very consistent with overall seasonality. Now, 
Again, when we look at this same period of time a year ago, this dip is much more significant, 25.1% uh, and property sold down 5.5% from this same time a year ago. We've talked about this in the seasonality uh, for 2020 was skewed. Right, so we are returning to a more normal belt of seasonality right now where we expect dips in the fourth and the first quarter um, with the largest kind of sales activity happening in the second and the third quarter of the year, uh, which was not the case in 2020. Obviously in 2020, we saw the most major dip happen in the second quarter, which is really uh, usually a big month. We saw that pent up demand being released in the third and fourth quarter of the year, as well as all the way into the first quarter of this year. Uh, we saw that pensive demand get released. So when we see a dip of 25.1%, we always want to inspect what we're expecting. We're going from a time frame when we weren't experiencing that standard seasonality. We saw big upticks. And so that drop, that spread, the delta uh, here is much more significant because of that. So just putting this, this into perspective here as well. All right, looking at our inventory trends, new listings, so we have been anticipating this dip that we see from October to November, right? That is also consistent uh, with a couple of things, consistent with seasonality, consistent with uh, what happened last year. We're seeing that dip here was a little bit more gradual at first, right? Uh, so we'll anticipate what we see this particular month, but we are see starting to see that drop of new listings down 15.5%. Uh, properties pended month over month up 1.6%. So the pendings are still on the rise in comparison to uh, last month. We look at new listings compared to this same time a year ago. Again, right, we're accounting for that seasonality kind of coming into play at that 20.5% decrease here. Uh, however, with properties pended, we are seeing an increase, right? We're seeing an increase. So there's still activity that is going on right now. Uh, this is important with your clients that are active right now in the market. You want to ensure that they see this, that when it comes to properties that are going under contract, uh, this is not experiencing a decrease, right? This is staying a pretty, pretty smooth here. This is staying kind of pretty consistent right now, even as we enter the last two months of the year. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on that as well. Uh, looking at our pricing trends, you guys know this one is important for us to look at is our average active price month over month. We're seeing an increase of 3.7%. We had a little bit of a plateau uh, right over here. We saw prices start to dip a little bit and now we're in that consistent uh, appreciation. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not the same level of appreciation that we experienced in the last year uh, when we look at the average sold price, it's a little bit slower right now, and yet that's still uh, appreciation. So again, we've had a lot of questions about whether the market was plateauing on price, right? I know that's something that a lot of the consumers are asking. Is the market plateauing on price? The average active price right now, uh, and then the no change in the average sold price tells us that no, there's not too much of a change that's going on right now. Um, we experienced that dip right? June, July, August, September, we started to see it go up slightly, not a big shift here. And yet we're seeing an increase here in October. And as of right now, an increase that we're anticipating to end the month uh, in November, we're seeing that 3.7% increase as well. Now, it's interesting because as we see sales trends dip down uh, during this kind of seasonality last quarter of the year, we see those sales trends dip down a little bit, right? The inventory dipped down a little bit. We are still in a low inventory market. And so supply and demand dictates that when the demand uh, overshadows the supply, prices reflect that. And so we're seeing that pricing still continue to reflect that here with that 3.7% increase in active price. Um, our average sold price, this is the important one, year over year, a 16.4% increase, right? Do they know that in the last year in Los Angeles County, the average sold price in their area is increased by 16.4%? Do they know the value of their home? Would they like to, right? That's, that's the language that we wanna be utilizing uh, for our clients here. All right, looking at absorption rates, 1.4 to 1.2, but we ended the month at 1.2 months of inventory. This is not a significant fluctuation. Again, right now that we're staying in the ones and twos in that kind of range, we haven't gone over two months of inventory, um, not too big of a fluctuation. 
for this to really be uh, make that much of an impact right now. Days on market, not too much of a fluctuation. This is a day change, 22 to 23 days on market. Um, sold versus original list price, though. You guys know I've been bringing up sold versus original list price quite a bit. Um, we are hovering, right? We're hovering at our sold versus original list price. 99%, but we ended the month at 100% in October. We're at about 100% of list price right now. Uh, we've been hovering for the last few weeks on pricing, fluctuating between 98, 99, 100, 101. That's kind of the spread that we're seeing in this county. Anytime we see fluctuations in sold versus original list price, the biggest uh, indication that, that that gives to me, that is what I would consider a lead measure. The lag measure being uh, what are the challenges or the questions that are going to come up when it comes to appraisals, right? So again, this is still, this is showing that we're at about 100% of list price. Average active price is a little bit higher. So we're seeing that increase a little bit. So this is, again, a number we want to watch, but because it's hovering, right, pretty even, it's not above, right? It, we're not at 101, 102%. We're at about 99 to 100%. Um, this is where I just want to be cognizant of this as I'm dealing with my appraisals, whether I'm representing on the seller side or I'm representing on the buyer side. We know that an appraisal can make or break a transaction. Right, an appraisal can make or break a transaction. If you were on the listing side and your client all of a sudden starts seeing big numbers and the property doesn't appraise and now you're in that negotiation, that's the takeaway, right? They're having something, even though it was never actually there because it's all um, unrealized potential gain that they would have had, uh, they're still experiencing that loss unless we have that communication with them up front that, hey, this is where we're listing it at. This is what the offers are in at. And yet there is a possibility that it does not appraise. And so I want you to be aware that this is where we're probably going to be on price. It is a lot easier for us to negotiate when they have that expectation. And all of a sudden they're expecting 30, 40 above ask. Same thing on the buyer side, right? We want to put the buyer in a positive situation so they know what to expect if there is the possibility that the appraisal may not come in. Um, so just to be aware of here as we look at sold versus original list price, this is where we're hovering. Uh, that would kind of be the main concern that I'd be looking at. All right, moving on over to Orange County sales trends, number of properties for sale. We're also seeing a decline of 15.4%. Number of properties sold, slight increase of 1.8%. When we look at month to date this month versus uh, this same time last month, we look at a year ago. This dip, the delta is much larger here, 47.8% and 15.8%. Again, this is accounting for our skewed seasonality. So we anticipate um, a dip, right? We have anticipated a little bit of a dip right now. Uh, and yet the dip to be that big of a spread, that has to do a lot with where we were from a seasonality, those months being artificially inflated last year. Looking at our inventory trends, so again, I want you to look at this, right? We can see this significant dip down that happens last year. That's about the time frame for seasonality. And we're seeing that right over here where we're seeing a little bit of that fluctuation was in pendant last month, right? We saw this kind of even out. That spread is not as big here as well. So, so putting this in perspective, 27.4% in terms of new listings, this is going on a downward trajectory here right, a downward trajectory here. Um, Pended is going on a downward trajectory, but not as severely as it was here, right? It's kind of going this way. So we can kind of see that that uh, spread is a little bit different right now. The new, the new listings, although there's a big decrease there, we're not necessarily experiencing that same um, intensity of a drop in terms of the pendant at only 4%. Obviously, we look at the same period of time a year ago and these drops, the delta is much more significant, right? We're kind of evening out a little bit. We're probably going to drop below what we did in December just based on, on what we're seeing in the market. We're probably going to see that kind of continue. Um, but again, this particular delta since being so big of a spread has a bit to do with that artificial seasonality, that artificial inflation last year. All right, looking at our pricing trends. 
Now, this is interesting. In Orange County, we are up in all four. Current, up 3.3% in average active price. Look at this growth here, right? This is a little bit smoother right over here. And this, we see this uptick up. We're seeing that continued uptick up right now of 3.3%. Uh, we look at this same period of time a year ago, and we can see that uptick. And then we look at that pendant price. Right, we're having an uptick of 19% from here. Right, about 19%. Now, I want you to look at this here. So we can see that when it came to pricing, the lowest price point in Orange County was actually in November. And then it kind of evened out right over here. It's a little more even kill over here, but we dropped to 994 here. So this increase of 19% is a significantly higher, um, but I will note, this is a little bit of an anomaly month, right? You can see that this was the lowest month for the average sold price um, across the board. So when we look at this year, year over year, this is a bit higher here. Um, that's gonna play into it, right? That's gonna play into it here as well. So just keep that in perspective here. Now I'm gonna note again, What's important here is our average sold price year over year. When we were having that conversation with potential homeowners in Orange County, what does that look like? Do you know that the average sold price in this area has gone up by 19% over the course of the last year? Just out of curiosity, do you know the value of your home? Would you like to? Or would you be offended if I prepared a market analysis for you? Um, this is a concept. So you guys have heard me talk about this before. I'm going to drop a piece of paper. When we are utilizing a script in conversation, um, this is going, I, I, I share this right now that we talk about average sold price because you guys hear me repeat these questions uh, and this kind of phrasing again and again. It is important that when we go to a client, we are speaking the language of real estate. If you ask a question like, are you interested in selling your home, right? That's a yes or no question. And the majority of the time, uh, we don't necessarily know exactly what the answer is going to be. We can't predict the answer to that question within reasonable certainty, right? And so it's not the most powerful question that we can potentially ask as, as a kind of in first conversation with somebody. Um, when we think about scripts, the way that I want you to look at this and the way that I want you to look at questions is we are trying to get somebody to a specific outcome. We're trying to get closer to that outcome. We're trying to deepen the relationship. We're utilizing um, you know, the language and communication to get closer to our desired outcome. So when we ask a particular question, right, or we phrase a question in a particular way, especially if it's a yes or no question, we wanna phrase it in a way that we are more likely to get the outcome that we are predicting. This is how you control conversation. So let's pretend that conversation is this piece of paper. I'm trying to get to a small segment of this paper. When I say something like, I don't know if you know this, but uh, the, the average sold price in your area has actually gone up by 19% over the course of the last year. Just out of curiosity, do you know the value of your home? Question number one. There's only two answers here. The answer is, yes, I know the value of my home or no, I don't know the value of my home. However, we can predict with fair certainty that the majority of the time, unless the person is a real estate professional, unless the person is getting a home valuation delivered to them every week, unless they're looking at Zestimate all the time, chances are that the majority of the time they do not know the value of their home, which means I've now controlled that conversation and predicted a particular outcome, right? Now, if my next question, if I know all of a sudden now I've sparked curiosity because I told them that the average sales price has gone up by 19% in their area, that sparks curiosity whether you're looking at selling or not, right? That's going to spark curiosity. Now I've determined that they don't know the value of their home. My next question should be designed again to fold this in half, right? To, to kind of shorten up the playing field. So Two ways that you can phrase it, um, the way that I like to do it. So just out of curiosity was the first part of it. Uh, the second part of it, I like to phrase using uh, language tools or language phrases that 
kind of decrease the defenses. So just out of curiosity is one of those. The phrase just out of curiosity um, is a neuro-linguistic programming technique. It's, it's kind of like a script moniker that's going to help you to kind of go past somebody's initial defenses and get them out of that defensive mode, right? That's one. Now, the second part of that, you can ask, would you like to know the value of your home? And that's a pretty simple, um, you know, pretty simple question. And the way that I like to phrase it would actually be more so around the line of, would you be offended if, script moniker, right? Would you be offended if I prepped the value of your home for you? Or I created a, a valuation of your home for you, right? Is I'm, I'm folding that paper again and I'm closing down the playing fields a little bit. From there, once all of a sudden they're saying, no, not at all. I wouldn't be offended if you prepared a home valuation for me. Now I can ask the questions that are going to be important. Like, hey, well, have you had any upgrades on your home? Is there anything I should know about your home or your neighborhood, et cetera, right? What work have you done in the home? Uh, now, when we're getting that information, we're slowly, again, decreasing the playing fields, right? Decreasing the, the playing fields a little bit. From there, now we've gotten all this information from them. We've built up this level of rapport. It's a lot easier at that point to say, great, let me get your contact information so I can send you this information. Now we're, we're, um, we're exchanging value for value, right? So that's part of the reason when I go over this, I, wanna, I wanted to just go into that concept a little bit of when we ask a question, uh, especially when we are prospecting or we're deepening a relationship, I want you to get out of asking the questions that have a very clear yes or no answer. If that yes or no answer is not going to move you for closer to your outcome. The questions that you ask are how you control the conversation, right? And take the conversation in a particular direction. That's why I repeat these questions again and again is because they have the power to decrease that playing field, to decrease the direction of where we're going to keep that control on the conversation. So going up on a tangent there on scripts, but I just wanted to give you guys kind of a little bit more of that tool. Um, looking over at our absorption rates for Orange County, down 12.8%, not a huge fluctuation here, guys. This is 0 0.7, 0 0.8. We've kind of been hovering around this. Again, not so much of a fluctuation here for this to have any real impact right now. Uh, days on market, no change. And here we are, sold versus original list price. So again, we had seen, now I want to put this in perspective, when we were looking at the pricing trends, we saw a little bit of dip in the pricing trends. And then we've seen that price appreciation come back. The same thing in this sold versus original list price. Over the last couple of weeks, we had seen this dip a little bit, right? 101 to now 100%. So we were at 99% at this period of time in the last month, although we ended the month at 100%. And now 101%, a 2% increase. Supply and demand, right? Supply and demand. When the demand is there and there's not enough supply, that is always going to impact our price. For everyone that said, hey, I think the market is plateauing a little bit. A lot of what the numbers are showing us right now is there are still plenty of transactions happening, right? They are still keeping prices up. So we're not seeing that much of a change. In California, we know is, is uh, projecting a 5.4% price appreciation over the course of the next year. So if you have clients that are saying, I want to wait because I think the bottom is going to drop out of the market because I think prices are going to go down significantly, this is some of the information that you can show them. We have not seen those price trends. They, they did go down a little bit right? A little bit, but they came back up again. Same thing with this sold versus original list price. We saw it go down a little bit and here we are back up. And yet the reason again, why I'm going to mention appraisals is because we're seeing that fluctuation, which means even though that active price might be higher, even though the sold versus original list price might be even right now, we know that the appraisal is based on the comparables of properties that have closed in the area within the last few months. And because we just experienced um, a couple of weeks, a couple of months that we were looking at where we saw that price fluctuate down, 
that is going to impact the comparables that are out there right now. So again, that's why I mentioned appraisals here. Um, all right. So Riverside County, our sales trends, number of properties for sale down 5.7%. Number of properties sold up 8.9%, right? That is going up is the number of properties sold. We are still seeing those transactions happen month over month. Looking at this period of time a year ago, this is one of the smaller spreads for Riverside County. Number of properties for sale down only 14.1%. Number of properties uh, sold down only 16%. Compared to some of the larger numbers we're seeing in some of the other counties, um, we've seen Riverside County continue to stay fairly active. This, I would say, I would argue has a lot to do with this price point being significantly lower. And so it is a very desirable kind of community. We're seeing a lot of that transitioning from LA to Riverside County, um, going outward in the county. Same thing with San Bernardino County. So I wouldn't be surprised if some of these trends were very similar there as well. Riverside County, looking at our inventory trends, new listings also down, right? Going down. It hasn't dropped this significantly yet. We're probably going to continue to see that go down, um, but down 14.1%. What is interesting here is look at this pendant going in the opposite direction here, right? Going in the opposite direction, pended up 20.5% month over month. So there's still transactions happening. There is just less inventory, less new listings coming on the market, which is absolutely going to impact price, right? This is the lead indicator that will impact pricing trends uh, in Riverside County. All right. Looking at those pricing trends. So you can see that here again. Look at this average active price up 5.1%. So put that in perspective. Let's go back over here, right? Number of properties pended up 20.5%. And we are seeing that increase in that average active price. As we have more transactions, supply and demand and listings are down. Those are going in opposite, right? Listing appendants are going up, listings are going down which means our average active price is reflecting that, an increase of 5.1%. This average sold price year over year up 17%. Do they know that in Riverside County, the average sold price in the area has gone up 70, 17% over the course of the last year? Just out of curiosity, do you know the value of your home? Would you be offended if I prepared a market analysis for you? Would you be offended if I uh, did a home valuation report for you? Right? It is. Okay, looking at absorption rates, 1.1, 1.2 again. So we are seeing this fluctuation a little bit here that this has been on the rise in uh, Riverside County. However, again, we are still in a seller's market. This is not enough of a fluctuation to have any real impact on that market right now. All right, Riverside County, days on market and sold versus original list price. No major fluctuation in days on market. Sold versus original list price right here, we are seeing a slight decrease of 1%. Um, again, you know, we're seeing those, this fluctuation is kind of staying in that 100, 101, 99, 100, 101 kind of price point here. Um, but we know that comparables for the last couple of, of weeks uh, may have fluctuated outside of that. I am just careful on because this is not staying consistently high. Again, I want to be considerate of that as I am appraising a property. All right, San Bernardino, our last last county, lowest price point county. Number of properties for sale down 8.4%. Number of properties sold up 12.3% month over month. We look at this same period of time a year ago, number of properties for sale is up 20%. Number of properties sold up 0.6%. That's not a big change here. That's a very small um, kind of fluctuation here, not normally akin to the seasonality we should be experiencing here. New listings. So here's the thing. Look at this new listings and pendants down in both categories um, in these numbers right here. Listings down 22.4%. We're seeing that decrease that was akin to what we saw over here. Pended. It was going up a little bit. Now we're seeing a little bit of that fluctuation down of 2.1%. We won't know these numbers until we really look at the final, uh, that final of the year. But it, we've seen this kind of continue to stay on this trajectory where we see more fluctuation in the listings, 
right? But this is experiencing a little bit of that dip right over here. All right, pricing trends. Again, average active price up. So I always say one month or one county does not make a trend. When we start seeing it across the board, all four counties, this is a pricing trend that we are seeing. This average active price going up has now happened in all four counties. This is a smaller increase. It is a lower price point, right? It is a lower price point. So that percentage is a smaller increase at 1.1% increase here. However, again, we had a lot of questions that were coming from clients, from the consumers, about whether prices had plateaued. We are seeing still price appreciation in that average active price. That average sold price up 4.6%. Average sold price year over year up 18.7%. California is anticipating an increase in the uh, average price over the course of the next year, right? This is not as big of a, there's, there was a little bit of a plateau. That plateau is not the case anymore. We're seeing this average active price stay pretty consistent, all right? Um, again, inventory trends here, 1.1 month of inventory. Not too much change here to make a huge difference in absorption rates for San Bernardino County. And last but not least, our average days on market up 4.5%. Not That's a day. It's a day difference, right? It's just small numbers, so the percentages seem a little bit larger here. Um, but sold versus original list price, look at this, 101 to 99%. San Bernardino County, I would absolutely be anticipating um, appraisals potentially coming in low. Right, just based on what we're seeing on sold versus original list here, um, make sure you are having that conversation here with your clients. All right, let's talk a little bit about some of the news, industry updates. So moving out of market update. Zillow after Zillow offers. I am gonna be sharing this article um, in the group for you. This was a really interesting article. Um, it's pretty funny. This article came out, I think, a day or two days ago. Um, this is a, um, it, well, this came out recently. This actually came out about a week, uh, two weeks ago or so, right? This talks about what happens next with Zillow after Zillow offers. A lot of the stuff that we talked about last week, where I mentioned Zillow kind of pivoting back to what they're, what they're ready to do, what they want to do, working with buyers and sellers. That is um, what is being anticipated, right? They, they are pivoting. This is a shift that is happening with Zillow after Zillow offers. They are, they are giving up a segment of their business to refocus on the business that is um, the biggest money maker for them. And so this article kind of goes into a lot of that. It talks about what are some of the trends that we're seeing. Um, there was a really interesting quote, which... which um, Rick Rudman, who is a, the president and CEO of a, of a tech company called Curbio, he said the market has a short memory. And I thought that was very, oh, I just jumped ahead, guys. Sorry about that. Um, I think that was very interesting for him to say that the market has a short memory, right? Um, because we talk about different shifts that are happening in the market. We talk about different companies, institutional investors. I'm always talking about different technology companies that are coming into the market, um, different things that are happening in the real estate industry, even Zillow's own story of making a promise to stay out of the, uh, the brokerage business and then entering into the business. And here they were building out a new segment of the business and the market has a short memory. People don't always keep that in mind. And so the anticipation that they're going to fail after you know Zillow offers being um, a segment of their business that they're removing I think is a little bit short-sighted to not see that their business plan is much more significant than that. Um, but I do want to, I thought this was a really good kind of analysis, uh, which I always take anything on Zillow, on Inman News uh, with a grain of salt because they're absolutely looking for the clicks. Um, but I did think that this was a pretty interesting analysis of what is happening with Zillow. So I wanted to share. Here's another one. This was very interesting. Um, I'm not going to go into this too much in depth today. I actually want to focus on this a little bit more tomorrow during our all partners meeting, but Los Angeles wants to ban iBuying, right? Los Angeles wants to ban iBuying. They're potentially looking at removing as certain strategies. Now, obviously iBuying is a very controversial topic that's been happening in the industry. 
it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out um, with this particular motion, what they're looking at doing, um, how they would look at stopping eye buying, whether this would be, you know, just the city of Los Angeles, what is that impact? Um, one of the things that's really interesting is when we look at California, in California specifically, um, there are quite a few zip codes that come up on the list of most expensive zip codes in the nation. This was another article that came out recently. Um, so it's really interesting to see a little bit of what iBuying has done in the market, especially with all of the controversy happening with Zillow. And now this particular um, piece of potential legislation coming out where they are where they are potentially look at stopping um, open doors, stopping Redfin, stopping companies like what existed with Zillow offers. Now that Zillow has already bought a bunch of properties in our market. So this will be interesting to just kind of watch how this plays out. But I wanted to bring it to your attention um, right now. Also, okay, so this is this is important. This is uh, really interesting. There has been a policy that has been going back and forth with NAR um, for a while now. This has been um, this has been going on for a second. This was, was supposed to be a CRMLS change that happened. There's been a lot of pushback. So the idea here was this proposal. Um, obviously, Zillow became a brokerage, and so this is, from my understanding, this is a big reason why this proposal even came out in the first place. Zillow became a brokerage. Zillow has one of the number one search engines in the nation when it comes to home search. If some of you may remember that years ago, Keller Williams had one of the first agreements. It was called My Listings, My Leads. We had an agreement with all of the syndication platforms. We had a little bit of leverage. We are the largest real estate company in the nation. Um, we're, we're the largest by units, agent count, and volume in the United States. That gave Keller Williams leverage. That leverage meant that Keller Williams negotiated certain agreements with companies like Zillow that basically said, if you want to utilize our associates listings through these syndication platforms, because we have the ability to turn that off on the back end, um, if you before, right, when they were a syndication platform, if you want to utilize our associates, um, you know, listings on your syndication platform, we require that you keep our agent's information at the top. And so for many, many years, if you went on to Zillow, um, for the life of that agreement, a KW agent, even though there was premier agents on it, our information showed up at the top. Now, over the years, obviously, um, you know, every contract times out. And so that contract had an end date. And then Zillow transitioned from syndication platform to brokerage platform, right? But they are one of the largest, they were one of the largest syndication platforms in the nation. They are. Um, and now they're a brokerage in many areas. Now, there are different rules when you are a syndication platform and you are licensing listings to syndicate on your platform versus when you are a brokerage. As a brokerage, if you notice on any listing that is not one of our listings, right, or is not a KW listing on your website, on any marketing platform, there's a whole rules and guidelines about this, but they say courtesy of, and then they generally will say the listing brokerage, and maybe it'll say the listing agent information. This proposal that came in was, there was um, a lot of argument, which, well, now that Zillow is a brokerage, they, we can no longer say, no, you can't have our listings on your site, or we can't turn that on, or we can't have certain requirements. Before we had the ability to turn off syndication on the back end, your client could sign something called a seller exclusion from the internet, right? The selli, S-E-L-I, um, seller exclusion from, from listing their property on the internet. Um, and we, as a brokerage, we gave you, so every brokerage has their own settings that they make on the back end of the MLS. We gave that control back to you as the agent where we said it is gonna be up to our agents to decide with their clients, if their client wants to syndicate their listing onto all of these internet platforms. And so you have the ability to do that when you input a listing. However, that is only for syndication platforms. Now that Zillow was a brokerage, this changed things. Zillow had the ability to syndicate whether or not your client opted in for marketing on the internet if they opted for marketing on the MLS. 
They can also fill out an SELM to exclude it from the multiple listing service. So that's another form that your clients can fill out at time of listing if they do not want it on um, any platform that is for multiple listing. What this proposal was going to do was basically saying, hey, we're going to now display the listing firm's contact information as prominently as any other contact information, meaning let's say that Remax, right, as a, just an example, put a KW, they're syndicating out a KW agent's information. We know that everything says courtesy of. What this was going to require was that it didn't just say listing courtesy of, but it said listing courtesy of Monica Rivera, Keller Williams Realty, Southeast Los Angeles, with my contact information. As prominently as that person's website contact information, as any other contact information, meaning if they had their phone number and their phone number was a certain font, they had to have my number in a certain font, right? So this is what this um, attribution proposal was entailing. As of right now, this particular requirement from this proposal um, was, was stricken from the proposal. So it's going to be really interesting to see what sticks with your proposal. This is now going, um, so this is now going to the board of directors for the National Association of Realtors to see kind of what happens next. But this has been kind of going back and forth for quite a while. We had seen um, some CRMLS rules come out about this. The problem is, is that you have a ton of different MLSs and not everybody was in agreement. So while CRMLS was like, here's our new rule, go in and put your information on the back end. Not every MLS was in agreement. And so there's been a lot of controversy around this. Uh, so this will continue to kind of unroll. This is really more so for agents to kind of know what this is going to look like. Um, and we'll find out what else of the attribution proposal is going to change. Um, from my understanding, when I looked at some of the stuff on this proposal, there was a possibility to even have the ability to market listings that are not on an IDX. So as of right now, if you want to share somebody else's listing and you don't have written permission, the only way that you can do that is share a link to the syndication. So meaning you could share a link from your website of somebody else's listing on your social media. You can share the link, but you couldn't share a flyer with somebody else's listing on it without their permission or a social media graphic, but you could share the link to that listing through IDX, right? So through your website. That's kind of, um, so it'll be interesting to see as this, as this kind of comes out, this is the background of it, where it comes from. This is the new requirement that was stricken from the proposal. Now this proposal goes to the board of directors um, and we shall see what happens from there. But I want you to kind of be aware of this because this may change how we market certain information and what the requirements are when we are marketing a listing specifically. So we'll keep you posted on this as well. Okay. Next door, next door went public. I just wanted to let you know, obviously we talk, the reason that I share this, so two reasons that I'm sharing this. One, when we talk about uh, prop tech companies, so you guys hear me talk about prop tech companies a lot, right? We know that the majority of prop tech companies are looking for two things. They're getting invested in by VCs to either go public because they think that's where they're gonna make money, or to sell next door when public. This is gonna be a really interesting, uh, you know, kind of as this unrolls, it's gonna give next door more capital so that they can continue to develop their technology. That's one of the main reasons a lot of companies like these go public is so that they can get that initial investment to continue to develop their products. Um, but next door is a company that we are partnered with. We do have a very special agreement with next door, which means, they have made the data pledge with Keller Williams that they will not utilize your data against you, that they are not using their data to um, make you know, shifts in their product. Um, and so this is going to be interesting to see how this unfolds. But next door is one of our partner companies, um, similar to the way we are partnered with Facebook, uh, Google and Instagram as well. Um, and a couple other, plenty of other companies that we're partnered with. But this is a notable one because Nextdoor um, was one of the initial partnerships that basically helped us create the neighborhood nurture technology that comes from our partnership with Nextdoor. So just wanted to share this um, with you guys as well. Okay, normal industry updates. There is not much change here. I've talked about the ADU grant program. I've talked about um, the 2022 housing market forecast. 
I've talked about mortgage rates kind of fluctuating uh, and applications trending down. We've talked about Senate Bill 9. I'm not going to go in depth here. Mortgage relief, unfortunately, no update. This is still in development. But again, keep an eye on this. It just hasn't been approved by the U.S. Treasury. That's the main thing that we're waiting on is the proposal was sent to the U.S. Treasury. The U.S. Treasury has to say, yes, we approve and we're sending you the billion dollars so that now you can start to um, put that in place. So no major update here as well. But I do have an update on KW segments. Those of you that are on this call are the first to hear this, are going to be the first to hear this. Sports and entertainment is officially launched. Sports and entertainment for Keller Williams has officially launched. I am going to share a link to the website for you right now. Um, we, oh, 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 oh. If sports and entertainment is a segment of the market for KW that are in, I just shared the link with you. This is going to be, um, we had a chance to hear about that this morning. We've seen since luxury relaunched, Keller Williams has tripled our luxury market share. KW Commercial is in the midst of a relaunch. New Homes is was launched out this year. Our Veterans Network was launched out last week, right? Sports and Entertainment Division, this is huge. It is um, representing professional athletes, musicians, artists, um, a lot of this luxury clientele, right? A lot of luxury clientele. Uh, Jordan, Jordan Stewart is now the KW Sports and Entertainment Director right? He's going to be at the sports and entertainment director. He is one of the agents in the industry who has worked with more sports and entertainment clients that has ever been possible. I want to talk about what this is going to look like. I'm going to go um, more in depth, but he has represented and advised over 500 sports and entertainment clients specifically, a very diverse group. What's very interesting about some of the things that they've done to create this I want you to know there is going to be a sponsorship opportunities in the sports and entertainment division with top NCAA athletes. I'm talking co-branded social media posts, private teleconferences with athletes. Um, some of the networks that they've already started creating for this are absolutely phenomenal. I know we have a couple agents uh, that are here in our office that have represented, um, you know, celebrities that have represented uh, athletes that have represented musicians. Um, obviously, we keep the names a little a little private in, unless we have those those uh, agreements that are available. But we have had the opportunity to represent uh, multiple people in the sports and entertainment field within the last couple of years. Um, and so this is definitely going to be a really interesting new segment of the market that comes in. Um, there is an application process to be part of this. But if it is something that is of interest to you, Come talk to us so we can guide you through that process because this is an extremely um, amazing opportunity within the Keller Williams division. We know new homes and the new home uh, segment. We've talked about this a little bit. Just to review, this is coming up on December 14th and 15th for the Builder Developer Realtor Education course. KW Relocation, I have no update for you yet. Um, but this, again, is also going to be something that we are working on very, very closely here as well. And then our KW School of Real Estate has officially launched. So this is going to be huge. If you know you have students that are interested in potentially getting involved, getting their license, et cetera, right, this is going to be a great opportunity. So a lot of information, a couple of reminders, my friends. Tomorrow, tomorrow, we have our all partners meeting at 1230. It is our all partners meeting, vendor appreciation potluck and veteran appreciation, right? In, in lieu of Veterans Day, which just passed um, as well. So important announcements that we'll go through tomorrow. I am making a ham. I know somebody's making a turkey. We've got all kinds of different snacks and goodies that are coming in, my friends. I am gonna start, I have to cook it for like eight hours. So you guys know I'm gonna be starting as soon as I leave here to cook that for you guys today. Um, but yes, it's going to be a lot of fun, just an opportunity for us to do a couple of things. One, you know, have the opportunity to spend a Thanksgiving together. You guys will get a chance to see some of the construction um, here at the office. It's looking phenomenal uh, as well. And we'll be finished probably by the end of this month. 
Um, and, you know, we'll have a chance to spend some time together and show some appreciation to our amazing team of vendors uh, around us. We are also having a holiday party, my friends. It is official. We've locked in the location. Um, the RSVP was sent out last week. Please RSVP, right? Please RSVP. We do need a headcount uh, for the event as well. Um, that is going to be on December 9th, from, starting at 7 p.m. to midnight. So we are really looking forward to it. We've missed everybody and it's time for us to kind of come back all together. Uh, and then we are having a fix and flip class. So obviously we have a lot of classes on the calendar. We're going through the new purchase agreement. We're going through um, scripts and role play and a lot of those different things that are on the calendar. But we are also doing a fix and flip class, which is gonna be on December 15th, right here at the office um, that Pavan is gonna be teaching. It'll be one of the first big events that we hold with our new facility. So we are really excited about that. Um, and I just wanted to give you guys those updates in advance. With that, I hope you have an absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal rest of your day. And I will see you soon, my friends. Bye-bye. Thank you. Absolutely.